Your fasting glucose is important. Do not get me wrong. But I think a lot of us are taking it way too far. Okay, it's the easy number to look at. It's an easy metabolic marker to see when you go and get a checkup. But it can also send us down a path of just mental frustration. There are other things that are arguably more important. You see, when you're looking at the big equation of just how you handle carbohydrates, your glucose response, your insulin response, there's three things you really look at. You look at your fasting glucose, you look at what's called your glycolated hemoglobin, your HbA1c, but what I think is one of the most important things to look at is what happens a couple of hours after you eat a meal. Now, why is this so important? It's critical because when you eat carbohydrates, it's normal to have a glucose spike. And I think right now we are living in this generation where there is an obsession in the world of content with talking about high levels of glucose. And this gets confusing, and I hate seeing people get so confused by the fact that they think that having a high glucose spike in an acute fashion where it spikes up and then comes down is a bad thing. If that did not happen, that would be a horrible thing. If you eat carbohydrates, you should spike, but you should come right back down. Okay, remember, you consume carbs, pancreas secretes insulin, the insulin allows the carbs to leave the bloodstream and go into the cell, consequently glucose comes down. So where you have to look at things is, okay, my fasting glucose might be somewhat elevated, but this can be determined by a lot of things, which we'll go into in a second. But what happens two hours after you eat a bowl of rice? Did your glucose spike and did it stay spiked? Because that is a better indicator of what's going on. And even with your HbA1c, that is a lagging indicator. But what if you're starting to develop some insulin resistance? Or what if you have temporary insulin resistance that is triggered by poor sleep or by extreme stress because that can absolutely happen. Okay, that might not be reflected with your HbA1c because it hasn't been chronically elevated for a long period of time. What we have to understand here is that there is a difference between glucose toxicity and having chronically high levels of glucose for a long period of time and what is gonna be insulin resistance at a specific point in time. And what I mean by that is that you could have a level of insulin resistance that is not yet reflected by your HbA1c. Does this mean don't do your HbA1c test or don't do a fasting glucose? Absolutely, positively not. Please do them. They're important. They're vital. But I think the one that people don't look at enough is that two-hour postprandial. So we'll come back to this in a second. Let's talk about insulin resistance and the difference between physiological insulin resistance and pathological insulin resistance and some things that you can do to kind of help this process out. Physiological or peripheral insulin resistance happens when sometimes you exercise a lot, it happens when you don't eat a lot of carbohydrates or when you're in a very low carb state, and the reason behind this is because the cells within your periphery, like your muscles and things like that, they're so efficient at using glucose that they actually don't really need a high amount of insulin, right? So you become somewhat insulin resistant because your body is so good at utilizing fats. You see this in fasting individuals a lot, people that fast a lot or people that do super low carb. They say, wait a minute, I'm insulin resistant. My glucose is staying relatively high. That's not the end of the world because that's physiological insulin resistance. And what's happening is the body is using so much in the way of fat that it is literally sparing glucose and that glucose can then go travel to the brain and it does other things. It does not necessarily mean that you're going to be glycating proteins and fall victim to all these other sorts of uh, glucose toxicity issues. Now, if you have this higher level of insulin resistance that is occurring even when you do eat carbohydrates and your glucose levels stay high all the time, I wanna be able to teach you some things that you can do to kind of help this. One of the things that I think is very, very critical is consuming enough protein. And I think that this is overlooked because right now we have such a movement towards uh, you know, eating more plants and vegetables and things like that, which granted, I think is very important. I'm a big proponent of fruits and veggies. I really am. But I think that protein needs to be the priority. Okay, because when protein is the priority, not only are you satiated, but you also have a glycemic impact. Okay, so when you consume protein, what's gonna happen is it's gonna slow down the absorption of the carbohydrates. So you're not going to send your glucose levels through the roof. And if you deal with insulin resistance, if you send those glucose levels through the roof, they're going to stay elevated. 
So when someone becomes insulin resistant, then the glycemic spike matters because then, and really only then, is a situation in which a high spike becomes a problem. Because in an insulin resistant individual, a high spike remains a high spike for a long time. And the risk of glucose toxicity is significantly more. So especially in people that are becoming insulin resistant or are concerned with it or are walking that line, they do need to monitor that spike because their ability to produce insulin properly is defective. I put a link down below for ButcherBox if you are looking for good quality meat. It's somewhat relevant to this video and I feel like people that are watching this video might be interested, so what the heck. So they have grass-fed, grass-finished meat, grass-fed, grass-finished beef, delicious ribeyes, they have New York steaks, they have fillets, which my wife is a huge fan of. I'm just a big fan of the bison and the ground beef. I'm just a big ground bison person. It's simple, it's easy, it's fairly clean. I just like it. So I put a link down below. It gets delivered right to your doorstep with food costs being expensive, gas being expensive. I really think the butcher box is a really cool way for people to go if they're just tired of spending money on gas and they just want the convenience of being able to choose cuts that they trust. So that link is down below. A big thank you to them for allowing this content to be possible. And you know, the net impression of this video isn't just go use ButcherBox. I'm saying it as a thoughtful suggestion because it makes sense and because I know people who watch this video are probably interested in it. So the link below will take you to ButcherBox and you can choose some custom boxes as well. It's pretty cool stuff. Okay, so now that we've learned that protein is important, what are the other things we need to know? Well, once you're insulin resistant, uh, things change. Okay, insulin is not being secreted at the same rate. So again, if we have two people, one person is uh, not insulin resistant and one person is insulin resistant. If the not insulin resistant person goes and eats a bunch of carbs, their carbs spike their glucose, they come back down. If the other person eats carbs, they spike and they don't come back down because they don't produce insulin. I know I sound like a broken record, but I really want to get this across, right? Well, what can you do about that? Well, regardless of whether you're insulin resistant or not, exercise and moving your muscles is going to soak glucose into the cell, okay? So it allows someone that is insulin resistant to be able to get their glucose levels down without their pancreas having to produce a lot of insulin. The way that the pancreas works in terms of insulin resistance is all about a vicious cycle, okay? So if you are in a situation where your glucose levels are high, those high levels of glucose continually damage the pancreatic beta cells so they get even worse at producing insulin. The worse they are at producing insulin, the higher your blood sugar goes. Vicious cycle, it gets worse and worse and worse until you're full-blown type two diabetes, right? Okay, so the opposite is true if you start to spiral it the other way. If you start to A, reduce carbohydrate intake and pay attention to the glycemic index of foods that you're eating, because that's when it does become important, but you also find ways to reduce your glucose without insulin, you can slowly turn that dial down and allow the pancreatic beta cells to restore again. One of the best ways you do this, and it's no, it's not fun, but is walking and moving after eating carbs because that movement lets glucose into the cell without insulin. So you can unwind the spiral and let the pancreatic beta cells recover a little bit and maybe even repair and hopefully get yourself back on track from insulin resistance before you're into a much harder to reverse type two diabetes type situation. And I know I've come around in kind of a full circle, but the big important piece here is what is happening two hours after you eat a meal? That is going to be painting the biggest picture into your metabolic health as far as glycemic response goes. As always, I'll see you tomorrow.